Uh, now, just for those, just a really, really quick uh, uh, summary of approval, approval voting is basically you vote for each candidate that you like, and whichever candidate is liked by the most number of voters wins. Uh, and so you're choosing a candidate that has the largest consensus. Uh, and it prevents the spoiler effect, which is a, a big deal that, you know, Aaron probably go into more detail about. So Aaron's going to talk about how he how they went from having virtually no resource to being actually able to implement uh approval voting in different places. So we'll talk about the movement, how it's been successful, and maybe what lessons we could learn from that. So I'll give the floor to Aaron now. Cool, thanks. And I'll go ahead and share my screen real quick. Uh, let's see, cool. And here we go. Cool, all right. So able to see all that? Awesome. Uh, so to kind of preview everything that we'll be talking about. Uh, so I'll briefly go over uh, pool voting um, very briefly. The, uh, there's a subject that you kind of already on board with that component. Um, I'll go through and talk about the center production science, how we started. Uh, you're going to see uh, kind of a, a very scrappy organization um, without many resources and how we grew from there how we had those early wins uh, with, uh, uh, with Fargo, uh, how we were able to succeed with uh, St. Louis and some of the structure and strategy that we're changing with as we're moving forward. Uh, so that's gonna be kind of what we're talking about overall, um, a bit about me. Um, so I uh, co-founded the organization in 2011, been looking at voting methods for a very long time. Uh, been interested in uh, EA since 2016 and started to uh, do conferences when I was uh, in 2017. Um, uh, also uh, personally do uh, jujitsu, uh, which is uh, uh, strangling and uh, chokes. Uh, it's a very great exercise as well. Um, and uh, also do a lot of lock picking as well. Um, so uh, that's uh, me. The uh, so here, it's a brief history of, of CS. So uh, I'll start off by maybe uh, mentioning uh, approval voting, which is what we focus on pretty heavily. And uh, there's no slide on this just because we're gonna go over it kind of superficially. Uh, so our organization really early on started to move forward with appro approval voting because of its uh, simplicity, as well as doing well on other factors like winner selection, and doing a really good job of capturing support for uh, for candidates. So it did well in kind of the qualities that you would want a voting method to do well in, but also it was very practical and simple. And because of all these factors collectively, we really went forward with that. And approval voting itself is just selecting all the candidates that you want and the candidate with the most votes wins. Um, so that's the, the method that we are, are pushing. So when you see, if you don't know already, if you see approval voting comes up, uh, that's what we're talking about. So uh, we all have our kind of own personal stories for how we got interested in voting methods. Um, uh, personally, uh, it was during the uh, 20, uh, let's see, that was uh, 20, uh, 2008. Um, so it's going back so far, uh, the 2008 election. And during the primaries, I was in graduate school. This is my second graduate degree in, in public health. And talking with other friends um, and classmates. And during that discussion, everyone voting against their interest and talking about it and really being somewhat fine with it. And I found that really annoying. And so uh, that really kind of led my spurt towards uh, going and thinking about voting methods, thinking about why people would go and vote against their interests, particularly people who were so enthusiastic about certain causes. And so um, in 2008, like I really, started to think about voting methods and even realized that it was a thing. Uh, because before then, I don't think I realized that voting methods was a thing that was a, a, an actual concept. And so <clears throat> uh, after learning about uh, voting methods, um, I uh, scoured the internet, uh, just seeking more information. And uh, in, in doing so, I had stumbled across a Google group that had been around well before 
Uh, I had even uh, come to be aware that uh, such a thing as a voting method existed. Uh, and it was filled with engineers, mathematicians, people with political science backgrounds. And it was just a, a frenzy of discussion. And so in talking with folks there, uh, we could see that there was more of a pivot towards cardinal type systems, which deal with scoring. And so uh, I, I had asked the, the folks that were like, well, like what, uh, are you doing anything to try to make these uh, voting methods a reality? And they showed me some uh, work that they had done in terms of uh, uh, documents for incorporation and bylaws. And it really didn't look that organized. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I said, well, like it doesn't look very good, but I don't know how to do this either. Uh, but you know what, by that time I was in law school. Uh, so uh, while in law school, I had joined a nonprofit incorporation project, uh, which fortunately my law school had. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have it anymore, but uh, I was very lucky with my timing that they had it when I was there. And so got to learn how to do all kinds of uh, bureaucratic fun. Uh, and so after learning how to do all that bureaucratic fun, uh, uh, all those documents that were kind of in disarray before suddenly uh, became more organized. And uh, in 2011, uh, we filed the Articles of Incorporation uh, for California and a resident agent there. Uh, one of our initial board members lived in California. So it was very simple uh, to make him the resident agent, just a person who receives mail in case you get sued. Every company's got to have one. Uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, documents uh, we got are um, uh, 501 C3 status acknowledged by the IRS in 2012, which was uh, just a little bit after I passed the bar. Uh, and so uh, this was this uh, fun paperwork was the, uh, uh, the official uh, origin for the organization. Um, so now, uh, in 2011, uh, so I, I, I found that perhaps uh, crappy website images are uh, a good way to show your, your timeline in terms of, uh, of progress, and, uh, particularly as a virtual organization, that's kind of our, our outer face. And so in that top left, uh, you see the 2011 website for the Center for Election Science. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then as it progresses forward uh, in 2013, so it's uh, uh, 2011, 2013, 2015, uh, bottom left is 2017, and then uh, bottom right is 2020. Uh, and one of the things that you see with these is that we do a lot of focus on uh, articles um, and really resources. And when you don't have any money, that's about all you can do. Uh, you can't really do uh, much uh, beyond that. Um, and in 20, uh, uh, 2013, uh, we did that uh, Plantsville video. Um, with uh, Mayor Blueberry, that's the one on the, the top left that you can see there. And it's, it was the first explainer video on approval voting. Um, and so we did a crowdfunding project. It cost like 10 or $11,000 to do that. Well, whenever you see these videos from uh, folks doing promotional stuff, uh, it's, it's expensive. Like when, when you think of like, oh, like that looks really good. It's like, well, it's, Probably because it cost a, quite a bit of money and talent to, to get that done. Um, so uh, that we use quite a lot in marketing for approval voting. And the other thing that we had done aside from the video, getting a bunch of, of articles uh, on the website, uh, we also built up a board of advisors as well, um, including uh, Stephen Brams, uh, who was one of the uh, folks who set the academic uh, groundwork for approval voting, as well as a bunch of other hot shots, including uh, William Poundstone, whose books really inspired a lot of folks to get involved in the movement. So uh, in 2015, I, uh, sorry, in 2013, I became the executive director. Um, and for a while, I was also kind of running a couple organizations at the same time and didn't have the capacity to be able to really um, put CS really where I wanted and, and all of our board uh, wanted as well. And in 
2017, I went to the my first uh, EA Global, and during that EA Global, I met Will, um, uh, and fortunately, he was very excited about the idea of uh, electoral reform and was familiar with a lot of different voting methods, and he was able to make the introduction to uh, Open uh, Philanthropy Project, and after a whole lot of vetting uh, over the rest of the course of the year, we were able to get our initial grant um, of uh, about $650,000, um, which for our comparison, um, uh, before this, our largest uh, amount of income for a year was under $50,000. Um, and so it like ranged from like ten dollars to $50,000 a year. And you can't, uh, do much to change the world in, in this in this manner with uh, with that kind of budget. So, um, with uh, after that grant, um, we brought on. Uh, so the folks in the back row are the board of directors, and um, uh, as far as staff, uh, we have uh, um, uh, Caitlin and Kirsten uh, in front there. Uh, Caitlin is our director of operations and programs. Uh, Kirsten is our former director of philanthropy. Uh, having full-time staff is really amazing. Um, so we could do all kinds of stuff, even with a, a very small team. And uh, we were able to do that with uh, the result of the, of the grant. Um, and so now that we had funds, we, we had set up this uh, organizational structure. And um, uh, fortunately, we had already started a relationship with some folks in Fargo, North Dakota. And so this is that story of Fargo. And it is the Fargo, of course, that you're thinking about, the one with the uh, wood chipper, and that's uh, Keelan. Uh, and by the, the wood chipper, the, uh, uh, the, I think that's a copycat one, like that's a, uh, a replica. The actual one is out in the, the front of their lawn at the visitor center in Fargo. Um, but that's the, the same one. And the reason that Fargo was an interesting place to be is because like a bunch of cities, they have a terrible vote splitting problem, uh, which happens anytime you have more than two candidates that have some uh, competitive and sometimes even not so competitive candidates uh, that can change the outcome of the election merely because uh, people, people, uh, candidates with um, uh, similar uh, policies or, or backgrounds uh, run at the same time and you have the vote dividing between them. And it can be difficult to tell who wins and the person who, who does win, even if they are the right winner, uh, what are you gonna do to lead a city when you have 22% support and you know that 78% of people voted against you. So, um, so the council itself realized that that was a terrible problem. And so they created a task force and the task force job was to uh, fix the, uh, the problem of the city's elections and think about a new voting method. Um, and uh, fortunately, one of those folks uh, on that task force was the, uh, uh, the, the, the tallest. These are uh, a lot of tall people in this picture, although it can be difficult to tell. But uh, Jed, the person on the task force uh, behind us is about six foot eight. Um, I'm six foot one, uh, and so like just like Bunch of tall people in this picture. Uh, and so uh, Jed on that task force had reached out to us and said, uh, hey, uh, our city really, uh, has this issue. Uh, I think approval voting is gonna be able to help address the, uh, the issues that we have. We also um, can't afford uh, fancy voting machines. So not only does it look like your the approval voting method can solve the issue that we have, but it can also do it with the resources that we have as well. And so uh, Jed, after uh, making friends with us, um, went back and convinced the rest of the task force to advance approval voting and recommend it to the council. And the uh, uh, council did a whole lot of nothing uh, for quite a while. Um, and so the uh, uh, Jed uh, got tired of, of uh, nothing and so, he uh, went and got the uh, signatures necessary to get it on the ballot itself. And after you get it on the ballot, of course, the work doesn't end there. Uh, so Jed went and 
uh, did a bunch of media stuff. We provided a grant for him uh, and the organization he started, uh, uh, Reform Fargo, and went on the campaign trail in the city and did a whole lot of campaigning, a lot of outreach. Uh, we also did an education campaign alongside him. And just, and this is uh, 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 Dakota. Uh, she was a volunteer in Fargo. This is her daughter. And they did so much work. Uh, there was so much work doing outreach, doing door to door, a lot of logistics, figuring out uh, texting, um, uh, planning. Uh, Dakota took time off work uh, and reduced her hours during the campaign so she could do even more volunteer work. Really amazing. So I just wanted to take a moment to point out how awesome uh, she was. Um, and this is her daughter. She made the news uh, doing the uh, campaign work. Um, and uh, all that work uh, paid off and we managed to win that campaign by 63.5%, um, which is also very helpful because it also uh, makes it harder for folks to repeal the voting method when it has so much support uh, too. Um, so not, you, you, you may find that uh, sometimes when you change a voting method in the city, some of the people that got elected by the old voting method may not be super enthusiastic about you changing their, their voting method. And so having uh, uh, heavy support among the citizens is gonna be able to help with that. And the, we were able to um, see approval voting uh, being used uh, just recently. Uh, and so there the, uh, um, this was technically a uh, two-person uh, election. Uh, they, they will also use it for their mayoral election. But the uh, two camps that won got over 50% support, whereas before, like we saw that uh, 23 support nonsense. And so Fargo is done with that. So it's exciting to see that move forward. And uh, so at the start of 2019, uh, we were able to get another grant from OpenPhil. Um, again, money is the way that we were able to do this work. And so uh, this was for over three years, uh, going through the end of 2021. Um, and we wasted uh, uh, no time. So we also brought in a new staff person. Uh, so the uh, Bearded fellow in the front row, uh, that is Chris Rowley. He is our director of, of campaigns and advocacy. Uh, we've also got some new board members um, and I uh, see Caitlin and Kirsten uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, we brought Chris on and um, he was able to help us uh, do a chapter program, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, also around uh, this time, uh, 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 Robert uh, Wiblin uh, was, was able to uh, interview us and talk about our work uh, on the 80,000 Hours uh, podcast. And it turns out some people were listening to that podcast. Uh, one of the uh, folks in uh, St. Louis, uh, Rob Schaaf, uh, listened to it and uh, shared it with a friend of his, um, uh, Benjamin Singer, who was working at Show Me Integrity. Uh, he's uh, in the, the back of the table there. Uh, and they had a bunch of experience doing uh, ballot initiative work in the past. And they were also pretty fed up with their city's elections, which like many cities had terrible vote splitting. And so we made friends with the folks in St. Louis. And you can see some of the vote splitting that was going on here. Um, this is the, uh, St. Louis has a uh, closed primary system um, uh, where uh, you have this kind of a general closed primary system where uh, the advanced candidates for their respective parties move on to the general election. And so like many cities, the, uh, it's very democratic uh, dominated. So basically whoever wins the democratic primary is pretty much a shoe in for the general election. And so we see again, terrible vote splitting here. And St. Louis being having a large uh, black uh, population uh, here in this case, there's actually a lot of boost putting among black candidates, uh, which caused um, uh, someone who could be considered less representative as the as the winner. Uh, the uh, mayor as well, who was who won this election um, during a lot of the protests that had gone had gone on and over the past year, 
um, also used an opportunity to uh, um, uh, dox a lot of the protesters, uh, naming their uh, the names and addresses of, of protesters uh, in the public. Um, so that was the kind of reputation that the mayor had. Uh, and so working with uh, this group, uh, STL Approves, and you had a lot of people here uh, who were really experienced with ballot initiatives. Uh, we had folks, a lot of uh, key stakeholders from the community, including some folks who were uh, elected officials. And here what we're doing, um, seeing it getting put on the ballot again and going through and doing the campaigning. We brought on a ton of, uh, of uh, folks who were um, uh, supportive of the bill, uh, sorry, supportive of, of the initiative, a number of elected officials, a lot of key stakeholders, um, the League of Women Voters, uh, also um, elected officials like uh, Corey Bush, who openly supported it, uh, SEIU, so uh, and a number of, of key players uh, supporting the initiative. And on election day, we see that it won, we, we uh, beat our record with, uh, with Fargo. Uh, this time it uh, passed by 68%. Uh, so again, having a real um, uh, uh, large, uh, large victory. Uh, so all that, all that work paying off. And so maybe uh, a little bit of a, of a recap there. Uh, so uh, you see this bullet point here of over 200,000 voter contacts. So while, while we have uh, really a great uh, idea here that does a lot to sell itself, it's also important that we run competent campaigns. And so this is just like one bullet that, in, and you see all these other points as well with all the um, allies that we've made during this campaigns, but it really is a lot of work. And so we don't take any of this for granted. We had good polling ahead of time, but still we made sure that we did the work to make sure that this was a success and made sure that people knew what they were voting on and knew what they could look forward to. And this was also, uh, we had a lot of vocal opposition from the St. Louis City Council as well, which uh, voted and passed a measure to oppose the initiative uh, that changed that would change the way that they got elected, and the mayor who won with all this vote splitting, right after uh, uh, the uh, proposition D, which was for approval voting, passed, she decided that she was not going to run as an incumbent candidate as an incumbent uh, candidate. Uh, so that was pretty uh, big news as well, that someone who was able to uh, benefit from vote splitting decided that she was not going to run. So what does this look like in the future? So if we look into our crystal ball, uh, courtesy of David Bowie. Uh, we have a chapter system and this we can thank uh, due to uh, Chris uh, Rally. Um, and again, like it is taking this kind of step, it's a uh, step back. It really is amazing. And really for, for me, really proud of what we've been able to do, uh, not just with Fargo and with St. Louis, but with this chapter system and moving forward with such a small staff. I mean, you saw in, 20, uh, uh, in 2018, like there were two other staff. Uh, and in uh, the beginning of this year, there was a third other staff. Um, and then uh, we also brought in a contractor, Andrea Denault, who was in the picture among the tall people. She was the tallest right behind uh, uh, me. Uh, she did a lot of the campaign work on the ground in, in Fargo, and uh, she's also continued to do work with us now, but um, not a lot of people, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of intelligence, a lot of strategy, and really uh, that's, that's what it's uh, taken uh, to be able to allow this, and as well as the, the resources necessary. But as you can see from all these little um, Google Maps, little uh, indicators, uh, we've got folks all over now. Uh, these are all uh, places where folks are uh, indicating that they um, want to be part of a chapter. And so we are all over the place. Uh, and so what are chapters? Um, so the chapters are self-organizing groups. Uh, they are independent of CES and they are all over the place. They can be representing cities, uh, states, uh, metro areas. Um, 
we are meeting uh, virtually. Um, this is uh, second nature to us already. We've, we're used to meeting virtually all the time. We've always been a virtual organization. We've embraced it. So this whole pandemic thing has uh, slowed us down probably um, the, the least among uh, many organizations out there. Like we, we took it pretty, uh, pretty well in, in stride as well as one could. Um, and these organizations, um, uh, they, they do uh, key parts like identifying uh, and working alongside us, uh, identifying the legal components. Like uh, you've got 50 different state laws. Uh, some places don't let you do ballot initiatives, some places do. Uh, some states don't allow cities to change their voting method because you have weird complicated rules like home rule, Dillon's rule. And then on top of that, if you're talking about a city, some other state law may prohibit a city from doing uh, voting in a way that doesn't agree with some kind of state statute. And so you got to research that for all the states or at least all the states that you are interested in having cities run initiatives. Um, and to do that, it takes some legal research. So we help with some of that legal research. Uh, when you're doing some of the state stuff it's, that have ballot initiatives, it's not quite as bad because you're changing technically the state law when you're doing the state level ballot initiatives. Um, so the legal research isn't quite as relevant there, although it still be useful in, in other concerns. But of course the state initiatives are much more expensive because they require many more signatures and you have a lot more people that you have to reach out to. The other com component is uh, polling. Um, so um, we saw like, for instance, in, like, uh, and we can learn from others. So for example, if you're in Massachusetts, you may have seen that the RCB initiative um, did not pass. But when you look at some of the polling, it looks like it never really looked quite very good to begin with. And so um, as a data oriented organization, uh, we look at those types of things more, more seriously. Uh, and so um, we, uh, we, we look at polling to inform our strategy and to figure out where we want to prioritize. And then with the, the polling legal answers, um, uh, uh, following that, it can make much more sense for an organization to go ahead and do more formal uh, steps of, of incorporating and then uh, moving along uh, closer to going ahead and initiating that campaign. And so uh, we work with chapters to help them uh, um, do all that and go through all that stuff, to go through all those steps. But in addition to uh, resources, um, well, I'll get to the part in a moment. Um, and drawing a chapter is very easy. Uh, as you saw earlier, uh, our website looks really cool now, as opposed to uh, perhaps what it looked like in the past. Uh, and so you just go and click that join the chapter program. We've got a whole chapter page and it's really easy to, uh, uh, to join on. Um, we group chapters by time zone. Uh, it's very fun to get to meet all kinds of cool people who are interested in um, moving their democracy forward. The other uh, incentive for um, uh, organizing and running chapters is that we also provide funding using a re request for proposals uh, uh, program. And uh, uh, that provides the funding for being able to do these other activities as well as being able to um, support and provide some of these technical resources and knowledge for being able to address those initial hurdles. And as we can see, we've got a number of proposals from places all over, uh, including Seattle, Utah, all these uh, awesome places that you can see in, in front of you. Um, and that's just right now, like uh, uh, this is the first time that we've done this and we've already got a bunch of really cool prospects. Um, and there are some uh, others that aren't listed on here that uh, are also uh, pretty exciting for us. And so like the, basically the, the way that we uh, do this is like uh, we require funding, um, running ballot initiatives and having the infrastructure to support this is very expensive. Uh, if we look at other organizations that, um, and this is kind of a fun kind of, uh, of way of framing it. Um, when, when we look at other organizations that work in, in this field, uh, say like looking at ranked choice voting, um, and we look at their budgets, their budgets really push the 5 million annually mark. And there are uh, multiple organizations that, that uh, 
push almost exclusively rank trace voting that have budgets of, of that size. And so um, uh, um, it really is expensive to, to do this and like for us to be doing what we are at uh, a budget right now of about a million a year um, speaks to what our, um, what our abilities are and uh, the ability for us to be able to leverage the resources that, that we do have. Uh, and, uh, and so using these resources to uh, run these chapters, provide them uh, the necessary uh, support that they need and going through and uh, um, helping to do one in more cities and, and also go into, into states. Um, and notice that now, like previously, both in uh, Fargo and in St. Louis, we took more of a, let's say more passive approach. Uh, in both those cases, they came to us. Um, here, uh, it's a little bit of a mix. So folks are reaching out to us, but we're providing these resources and um, are able to more strategically uh, kind of pick who we were able to uh, wanting to support based on strategy, logistic, logistics and resources to be able to, um, uh, to go forward. Um, and as a, a, maybe another kind of quick note kind of to show the acceleration of the, the way that we're going, um, this election cycle, um, looking at these balance issues that, that passed, the uh, um, uh, Alaska had just barely passed with its initiative uh, by about a percentage point uh, for ranked choice voting there. Um, and for a while it was it was down. So actually had Alaska not kind of scraped by with, uh, with this win, approval voting would have brought, um, this would have been the first election cycle where there were more new cities using approval voting than ranked choice voting. Um, just to kind of, we were, it was very close for that being the case, uh, this particular election cycle to give you an idea of the acceleration that we've done with the limited resources that we have. Uh, and we're very proud for, um, for, for moving at the, the pace that, uh, that we are. Um, and so that's, uh, that's our history. Uh, that's how we've accomplished these, uh, these wins. And this is the strategy that we're using going forward. So. Thanks. Thank you.